The governor of New York, um, Governor Cuomo, who gets sworn in, he takes office. And the day before he takes office, he actually reads his speech with his father, Mario Cuomo, who was, a, who was governor of New York before him. So he's reading his speech, and he's like, hey, daddy, what do you think about this speech? And his father's like, this is a very good speech, son. I think the, the people will love it, yada, 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 yada. He goes, he takes office on January 1st, and a few hours after taking office, his father passes away. The same father who was governor before him, the same father who read his speech and told him that it was a great speech, passes away. So we can't take it for granted that we've seen the second day of 2015, and hopefully we see the third and 365th day as well. But I'm so happy to stand before all of you. I don't know how many people here understand that they are blessed. Amen. 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 Good. Everyone said amen to that. You are blessed. And I know this month we're going to be talking about Renew Me. But before we could talk about Renew Me, you're going to be hearing sermons talking about the fresh winds of God, the 2020 vision that God wants you to have. Sermons telling you how God wants your attention. Sermons telling you to self-reflect and look within yourself, look at the mirror, you know, and see what's inside of you. But we have to first understand that we're blessed. And I think sometimes when we start thinking about being blessed, we think being blessed only means good things. It means that, you know, you know, hey, you have a lot of money or, you know, you got a boo thing or whatever the situation is. That's what some people classify as being blessed. And some people on the flip side think that being blessed means that, hey, I'm going through a lot of stuff, so that means that, you know, God has blessed me because it's always tough all the time. And both of those things are false. There will be hard times, you know? And that's a, that's a sign of that God is working. Hopefully, that's the sign, that's what it means. That God is working on you and he's building up your faith because sometimes it's not God, it's us who have put ourselves in bad situations. But also on the flip side of it as well, um, with some people just thinking it's always, you know, peaches and cream, that doesn't mean you're blessed either because, you know, I remember a great actor who made everybody laugh and we all thought it was peaches and cream for him, Robin Williams, yes, Robin Williams, and he's a man who, you know, suffered with depression and unfortunately because of his depression, you know, he killed himself. So just because it seems that you have everything doesn't necessarily mean you're blessed either, but we as people of God, we have to understand that we are blessed because we have God, I begin to think of a widow uh, by the name of Naomi. And in, in society, you know, especially back then, being a widow was not really a great thing. You know, being a widow meant that you were pretty broken. But God blessed her and allowed her to, you know, be a mentor for Ruth. Or I remember someone like Ruth who also was a widow. It was like, it's just a family tradition, I guess, for them. She was also a widow because Naomi's son, her husband, passed away. But this same roof eventually becomes the great-grandmother of the great King David, of whom Jesus Christ, that's the lineage of Christ. You know, I begin to think about Mary Magdalene, who everybody sees as, I guess, like the first female apostle. You know, that's what a lot of people call her. And Jesus Christ had to cast out six or seven demons out of her. You know, that's a person who you can say was broken. A lot of things wrong with her. But she was still blessed because God was with her and was working through her. You know, I begin to think of people like Peter, who, quite frankly, had a lot of anger issues and also had a lot of insecurities. But Peter was still the rock that Christ would build on. And I begin to think of people like Paul, who um, had a war conflict within, you know, because of his insecurities, because of his conflict within, because of partials at some points of his misunderstanding, you know, he began killing believers and he had this stigma placed upon himself that even when he became a Christian and wanted to spread the gospel, people were afraid because they saw him as this broken, lunatic, and nobody wanted to be with him. Even the apostles were kind of like, uh, 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 you know, but the re I say all this to show you that all these people were people that would be considered broken but yet they were blessed. Amen. And that's what I want to tell you today, that we are blessed, Amen. but it's not just that we're blessed, we're the broken blessed. Amen. We're the blessed that can show our scars and show them what we've been through and say, God, all of this yes. is why I'm blessed because all of this has become an experience and it's become a testimony. It becomes something that I can take and move forward with. And that's what God wants us to look at today before we go throughout the month go on, you know, the whole renew me thing, we have to understand this mindset of being the broken blessed. 
And I want us to look at Hosea 6, verses 1 to 3. And it's, I'll read it for you. Quickly, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. I'm going to read verse 1 again. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us up. The broken blessed. And that's the one thing that we have to also realize, you know, being blessed and highly favored, it comes with a price. There's a price tag on that. So we can scream and talk that we're blessed, but we have to understand there is a certain price tag with it. But that price tag also says, when you look at the toe tag, it says priceless on it at the same time. Because everything that you go through, everything that you deal with, it makes you invaluable. Nobody else has that experience. Nobody else will have that knowledge and that understanding. And you'll be able to impart so much wisdom and impart blessings onto other people through everything that you've been through. And that is what God oftentimes does. See, life is not just about happiness, but life has to be about joy. Happiness is but for a moment. And a moment is never forever. A moment is just a short period of time. But joy is something that will always last a lifetime when you have jo true joy, joy that comes from God within you. Life, there's always going to be pain, there's always going to be pleasure, and that's what life is about. But we have to, as people of God, take both, both of that, understand both of that, and say, I'm going to take both of them, and I'm going to charge and move forward and become the best person that I can be, and really walk into the calling that God has for me in my life, both in church and outside of church. So we already know that God has our lives back out for us, um, and any pain or pleasure that we may face, uh, stick to the pain, is purposeful. It's not for no. It is not just for any reason. Hopefully, unless you know you made a bad decision and it's your fault. But if God is allowing something, that's the truth, you know. If God is allowing something to happen in your life, He sees it occurring and He's allowing it, there's a purpose behind it. You see, Oftentimes, when we first get saved, we go through this thing that I like to call the honeymoon phase. So, you know, the romantic period. It's the time when you know you first got you know first got booed up, and you know flowers and all the chocolate, and you know every time you ask God for something, God is like, oh yeah, okay, there you go, there you have it. Just got saved, so everybody is calling you, hey brother, hey sister, how you doing? Every time you come to church, everybody wants to hug you. They want to make sure you're all right. You feel that every sermon that everybody preaches is your sermon. You know, that one was for me. Oh, wow, look at God answering another prayer. That's the honeymoon phase. Yes, it is. But then there's this period called the silent period. Yeah. Where you don't yeah. hear anything. Where yeah. you don't hear anything anymore. You're, yeah. you're praying to God and it's like, the only thing you hear is the crickets outside your bedroom. Hey. You know, you're, you're like, God, I need an answer. And the preacher is preaching. You're like, what? That's not for me. What? What is that sermon going to do? God, that don't. I know that already. That's not for me. And that's that silent period. And we need to understand that even when we, when we go through that silent period, that wilderness period, what happens is God has given us so much word. During that honeymoon phase, he's, you know, paid you the sun, he gave you the milk, he gave you the honey, he gave you the meat, you know, he gave you all the roses, all the gifts. And now, there's this silent or wilderness period. What happens is God is saying, I've given you my word. Now when you don't hear from me, I need you to be able to live off of my word. Because that same word that I gave you yesterday yes. is still relevant and prevalent today. Amen. So just because, you know, you're not hearing a new word for me today, or you may not hear a new word for me tomorrow, understand that I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that word that I gave you a month ago, that word when I gave you when you first kneeled down and got saved, that word that I gave you when you took that plunge and got baptized, that same word is the same word that's going to carry you through forever. And you have to go through that wilderness period because it's in that wilderness period that you begin to mature. As a Christian, you begin to mature as a person. So understand, as we come into 2015, some people, it's hoorah so far already. Some people, 2015, hit you rough. And throughout the year, there are going to be moments of wilderness. 
And those moments of wilderness, you have to remember whatever blessing that you heard from whatever preacher in 2014 or whatever blessing that you heard from whatever preacher in the beginning of 2015. Because God is saying, it's time for me to mature you. You see, we keep going to different levels in Christ, and as we get to the beginning of a certain level, God is there to kind of like you know, nurse you because it's a whole new level and that. You know, I gotta nurse you. But as you get in the middle of that level, because now he's preparing you to go from level 49 all the way to level 50, he has to begin to make sure that you're ready for that increase, as you're ready to reach that other echelon. And in order for you to do that, he wants you to build up. And sometimes building up means getting broken. Mm. I don't know how many people understand uh, working out. I remember when I used to work out a lot. Now I just run sometimes. When I used to work out a lot and lift, lift weights, you know, that's when I was swole. <laughs> what, what, what you have to remember, what you have to, what you have to know, is, okay, what you, Joe Burke, don't hit, come on. What you have to know about working out is this. You know why muscles get bigger? Muscles get bigger for one reason. Every time you pump weights, you're actually tearing apart your muscle. You're breaking it, you're hurting your muscle. And what happens is, now the muscle begins to heal. When it heals, it becomes bigger and stronger. That's right. mm -hmm. And that's what happens. It's scientific. It's a fact. But the same thing also is true in the spiritual, because we already know anything that happens in the physical is just a representation of what happens in the spiritual. It's to help us to better understand the spiritual aspect. So things that happen in the physical are, are just an interpretation of the spiritual. We need to have the knowledge and the wisdom, the insight from the Holy Spirit to show us that. So you begin to work out. You're tearing apart your muscles. That's why you, you feel sore, because it's torn, it's hurt, and now the, the muscles come together and they just get bigger, faster, and stronger. But they have to be broken first. And some of us, there's going to be periods in time as we're gonna start, you know, people are like, oh, what's this renew me challenge, this eight day mind, body, and soul challenge that you guys have planned out? You really wanna be part of the eight day renew me challenge? Or are you ready to be broken? Mm. Because saying, Lord, renew me is saying, God, I'm ready to be broken. When Sister Cassandra was leading praise and worship, not only was she saying holiness, holiness, but she also said brokenness, brokenness. I want your brokenness. What does that mean? I want you to bring me, to build me up, to make me stronger. More blessings, Lord. I want more of you. And that more requires the brokenness. But are you ready to be broken? Because to be broken is not an easy thing. Saying, God, I'm willing to be at my lowest point because I know when I get at my lowest... So the other day I watched the next Karate Kid, which is female version of the Karate Kid, right? It's Mr. Miyagi is telling it too. So he keeps telling her, like, she has to do a, a flying kick off of a rock, right? And then she he keeps telling her, pray, pray. And she's like, oh, I need to only pray. I don't know what that means. And he said, what? you know, it is Mr. Miyagi voice. I'm not going to do it. He said, the pr before the praying mantis, praying mantis, yeah, before the praying mantis jumps, what it does is it goes on one knee. And then from one knee, it's able to jump up and go to where it wants to go. So God, sometimes he's going to bring you to that low point, that point where you're on your knee, just so you're able to propel yourself and go to another level. And are you ready to, for that? You have to be willing and ready to do that. We have to remain confident that whatever God does, whatever that we're going to go through, that there is a purpose behind it. There's a reason that the Lord wants us to, to go through it, and we have to remain faithful through it all, even in the silent moments. We have to recall his word, and we have to stick to it. Amen. Amen, people of God. Amen. Amen. See, a lot of us have also gone, gone through a lot of things that we spoke about it a little earlier, we touched upon it, is we've gone through certain things because of our broken choices. You see, sometimes it's not because of God. It's not because, you know, this is something that's going to make us better and it's a flash on. It's not Satan doing it to you. Sometimes it's just us. Many of us, we have forged God's signature on the dotted line. Hey. And we've called it our, ours. We True. signed it and said, this is ours. But no, God never put his signature on it. You 
forces it where you thought you forced your signature and you're just going around saying like look this is what God wants from me and God is saying that's not even my signature that's a counterfeit and we force God's signature on something and we, and we wonder why when we move forward in it there's nothing that happens it's because God was never in it it was never his will for you so us as people we have to get to a place where we stop making broken choices Amen. and broken choices are not just Choices that we make without the will of God. Another form of a broken choice is also not moving at all. You see, oftentimes I, I, I hear people do this all the time in church. You know, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you go after this opportunity? Get into, you know, try to get into this program, try to get this job, and they just tell you, oh, I'm gonna pray on it, and that's all. But they're not really pray because you know it's one thing to pray on it because they're like you know I want to make sure it's God's will for me. This this it's for me. I want a job, this is how I know it's God's will for me. I apply to the job. I go to the interview. How's the interview? What's the dynamic between me and the interviewer? When I start speaking with them, do I, do I feel the peace of God in that presence? When I start looking into the program, when I start looking into, you know, if it's a, a firm or a, a business company, when I start looking around, is this a place that I feel that I can still be myself? In it. Is this a place that will make me compromise, you know, my faith? Is this a place that will, you know, remove me from whatever obligations that God has given me? Those things, that's how God begins to answer your prayers because then you have to move. But if you're staying in the same corner yes. and you're saying, God, answer my prayer, he's not going to answer your prayer because you're in the same lonely corner. You're going to have to turn around and see what the answer is. And you're going to have to move. Put it this way, right? You want a job. And you're saying, I'm just praying for it, right? If God doesn't want you to have a job, then that means he doesn't want you to have a meal. And I know I serve a God who wants to see us well, wants to see us fed. So sometimes the, the broken choice that we have is indecision. It's a choice of remaining stagnant. I always hear this quote, indecision is a decision. You have decided to be mediocre. You have decided to stay in the same place. So we need to get, get to a point in our Christianity, a, 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 a mature point in our Christianity, where we understand the difference between moving, you know, as we're praying with God moving, but we're not moving out of his will. Mm. And we also have to get to a point in Christianity when we know when we're praying about something, it doesn't mean that we're at a standstill. Pray about it. Because I remember a person named Nehemiah, when it was time to build up the, the walls, that he had to go and ask the king. Praying to God, asking God for this to be God's will. But there had to be a point where he had to ask the king. If he just said, God, I'm just going to pray to you, that I'm the person who's going to go, and we're going to go and make sure the wall is good. But if he never asked the king, he would have never had the permission to go and be protected. So there has to be a point where us as Christians, we understand that, yes, I have to pray on it, but there's also a move that I have to do as well. And I think that's where we have failed as a body so far. We have not gotten that understanding and we have not operated in that. But we need to begin to do it. A lot of people say that they're suffering for Jesus, but you're only suffering because of your foolishness. It's not because of Jesus. It's not because Satan hated on you. It's because you did dumb things. And you need to man up, woman up, and accept. Lord, I did dumb things. But now, I want to wisen up. I want to smarten up. I want to begin to do things the right way. And we have to get to that point as Christians before we're ever going to move forward. But today, I don't want to just talk about... I don't want to just talk about the people who did broken choice. But I also want to talk about the people who are obeying God in the spirit while working in the physical, in the natural, and life just happens to them. It's tough, you know. Classes are difficult and, you know, they study, they do study, but they happen to fail. You are working, but for some reason, you know, the bills are just much more than whatever income that's coming in. These things happen. Life happens, and we get in these tough situations just like Naomi and Ruth who became widows, you know, just like Mary Magdalene, who had these spirits on her, just like Peter, who just naturally had these insecurities and these anger issues that he had to work on, just like Paul, who was just a misguided individual and 
Jesus Christ had to encounter him personally for him to gain that wisdom and that insight. We all have these situations, but I want us to understand that just because we have bad patches, just because we have broken areas, it doesn't mean that we can't prosper in life. You see, all those people have broken areas in their lives, but the the broken areas, they were still able to prosper. You see, the broken blessed, the true blessed of God, it means that, yes, there is some pain, yes, there is some hurt, yes, there are some scars, but despite the scars and despite the pain and the hurt, I'm still going to prosper, I'm still going to succeed, I'm still going to go to the next level, I'm still going to have the glory of God be prevalent and prominent in my life, and we have to get that to that point. The, the, the scripture says faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? So what I see when I read that, what I notice is substance. It means that there is substance in faith. There has to be something that is tangible to it, something that's visible to it. At some point, you need to begin to see that. Jesus is not going to just tell you have faith and you never see anything. Been dealing for the same, with the same thing for 10 years. It's time to switch something up. What am I doing, Lord? Because it can't be Him, because at some point something has got to give. So we need to begin to look at that. The substance is people seeing that you were going through an issue, you were going through a problem, and God turned the problem around. That's the substance part of it. That's what it means to be broken, blessed. People seeing the change happen, people seeing that doors are beginning to open up. People seeing that you used to be a bitter person and now you're smiling a bit more. People seeing that you used to have no style and all of a sudden, Lord, this person knows how to match. This person knows not to wear that because it don't fit the, the, how you created them. You know? that's, that's, that's faith. That's substance. That's, that, those are things that people can see and can touch and say, okay, God is moving in this person's oh, life. That's being a broken Yes, God. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So we have to understand that our problem and our suffering, because we oftentimes do it as Christians, our problems are, and our suffering, they don't qualify us as a saint. That's not what qualifies you as a saint. But what happens is that your suffering is supposed to be something that's temporary. And we see it in Hosea 6. God will come and he'll heal it. He'll come and he'll mend it. Amen. The suffering, the pain, they are all temporary things. They are all temporary things. God put Hosea in a precarious situation where he had to marry a whore. Sorry, I don't know if that's a good word. I don't know, I don't know if that's good for the mic. A prostitute. Okay, I'm sorry. He had to marry a prostitute. And, you know, when we read Hosea, we see the words, but we don't really, we can't really see his emotion. I mean, you can kind of see it. He's hurting or whatever. He said, oh, man, I gotta go back again to this because Jesus is like, God is saying, hey, Go, go back, go back, go back. It's like, oh no. We see the words, but do we truly understand the emotion? Because that's us. We're the backsliders. We're the people who do that to Christ so many times. You do it to God so many times. And you know, we hurt him a lot of times. And it's because we are broken. The prostitute, she was broken. Yeah. That's why she kept hurting Hosea. She was broken and she was trying to fix it on her own. When Hosea had the tools to show her love, to heal her, and to mend things, even though she was broken, Hosea had the tools to put her back together and show her that she is a queen. That's right. And sometimes what happens with us is we are broken, but we keep backsliding, we keep doing things that are wrong, we keep you know uh, falling into negative situations or we're never able to prosper because we're trying to self-medicate. And God is saying, I need you to stop self-medicating and understand that I am your doctor. Amen. I need you to stop representing yourself because when you represent yourself, you're always going to lose your case. Amen. Yes. But I am your advocate. Yes. We need to get to that point where we say, Lord, I am broken. I am messed up. I'm torn up from the floor. Up. I'm sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> but I need you to come in and I need you to feel, I couldn't help it. I need you to come in and I need, I need you to fix it. I need you to heal it. I need you to medicate it. I need you to represent it. I, to know how to function as the blessed, we have to go back to the manufacturer. When we're blessed, we all know we have all the attention of heaven on us. God is watching us. We have the favor. We have angels who are protecting us. That's why you know the edge of protection. All that good stuff. 
But when you're blessed, it's not just heaven that has its eyes on you. Hell has its eye on you as well when you're blessed. And hell is looking at you because eventually, see, I'm going to say, she says it all the time. The word says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The weapons will form. It doesn't say that the weapons won't form because hell is looking at you. Hell is like, oh, he's blessed, she's blessed, coming forward. So the weapons will form. It's just that they won't prosper. But why, why in Isaiah 54, 17 does it say that it won't prosper? Because you have to read Isaiah 54, 16 when it begins to say that I know the blacksmith and the yes. destroyer. I created the blacksmith who makes the weapons and I created the destroyer. Therefore, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You need to know the manufacturer to understand how the blessing operates. You need to know the manufacturer to understand that because you are blessed, God has favor in your life. Because you are blessed, there are echelons that you will climb. There are mountains that you will move. There are places that you will go. But first, you have to know the manufacturer. The manufacturer is the one that created the blacksmith, the one that created the destroyer. So nothing formed against you shall prosper. Yes. Because you know the manufacturer directly. Amen. And that's what we need to also understand. So Satan sees us as broken vessels. And he has to look and say, what is man, what is woman that God is so mindful of these broken people? One thing that we need to understand is that Satan never had dibs on us. Mm. He never had any right to us. We're the only ones that could give him that right. We're the only ones. See, God gives us this thing called free will, which is a double-edged sword. You know, it's great because it's like, hey, God, like, you know, I, I do what I want. But it's also bad because it's like, hey, God, I do what I want. So sometimes the right that the rights to you that God has because of free will, he allows you to decide where those rights remain. And sometimes we give those rights to Satan. But he never had dibs on us. It's us that give him the dibs. But when we begin to give God the rights, when we begin to operate in the Lord, when we begin to say, Lord, I am your broken blessing, however you want me to go, whatever you need to do to renew me, one thing you're going to realize is Satan's going to find out that you're a bad boy. There's a quarterback in football, going back to football, named Aaron Rodgers. They always say Aaron Rodgers is a bad man. Why? Because in football, as a quarterback, that's the person who throws the ball for people who don't know. They always say, yeah, you're throwing with your arm, but you need a good base. You need to be able to plant your feet and throw. But Aaron Rodgers is the type of, of quarterback that he could be jumping in the air, mid-air running, and then he has to jump in the air. He has so much strength that even though his feet are unsettled, he can still throw accurately. There was a game this Sunday where he got hurt and his ankle or his leg, something was messed up. And this fat lineman, I'm talking about 400 pounds, and Donald Gonsu, steps on him twice. Some people say on purpose, some say not on purpose. The leg that was hurt, Aaron Rodgers still goes and he still wins the game. Why? Because he was a bad boy. Even though he was hurt, he understood the talent that was within him. He understood that there was a, a goal that he had to achieve, that he was trying to go to the playoffs, he was trying to win a battle, win the victory, and he was going to take everything that's within him, despite that he's hurt, and he was going to win the game. We have to have that same winning victors attitude and mindset, that though I may be hurt, though I may be crying, Though I may be suffering, I know what's within me. I know how God has blessed me. Yes, I am hurt. Yes, I may seem like I'm injured, but I will still get the victory. I'm not getting out of the game. I'm going to stay in the game because there's a reason that God has called me. There's a reason that he's put a charge on me. And I'm going to walk in that calling of God because I'm part of this team. And we need to get the victory, Lord. So whoever you need to be saved, whoever you need to be touched, or however far you need us to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to stay in your will and operate how you've called me to operate despite the circumstances yes. despite the pain Amen. so we need to understand this being broken doesn't mean that you're handicapped it means that you've gone through some things in life that have caused some cracks you've gone through some things in life that have caused some pain 
You've gone through things in life that have caused some hurt, that have caused you to lick your wounds. But just because you're broken, just because you're hurt, just because you've been nicked, just because you're, you've cried yourself to sleep night after night, that does not mean that you're hopeless, and it does not mean that you're worthless. Amen. You see, sometimes I look at these paintings, right? Leonardo da Vinci, Pablo Picasso, and sometimes I look at the paintings, I'm like, oh wow, that looks really nice. Sometimes I look at the painting, I'm like, I really don't know what that, what that is, what it means, and <laughs> quite frankly, that, that color looks ugly to me, and it looks like you're not even drawing within the lines. But, because it's Picasso, because it's Leonardo da Vinci, it's still priceless. It's still, it's worth something, but something so much that you can't even put a dollar figure to it. I begin to think of when you go to France or you go to Italy and you see some of these statues, right? And normally when you see statues, like you know, you think of the Statue of Liberty. Everything is there together, arms, legs, feet, their head. But you go to these places in Europe and here's a statue that has no arms or here's a statue that has no legs, or sometimes it's a statue that's showing all private parts, but the private part is cut off. But, PK, this statue that to me looks like it's broken or incomplete, it's a statue that you can't even buy. It's a statue that you can't even touch. It's a statue that you, if you even try to come close to it, you have all these armed guards that will come at you and break your neck. Why? Because Michelangelo created the statue. But I have this person who created Michelangelo Amen. that I know who's God, Amen. Jesus Christ, the head of my life. And like Pastor Harley said, he's not just God to me, but he's king because I can respect him as God, but do I respect him as king of my life? So I respect him as king of my life, which means he has dominion over my life. That's who has me. That's the banner that's over my head. So when you look at these statues and these paintings, it's Picasso, Da Vinci, Bastia, Michelangelo, people were fearing them. People put value to them because of who they are. I want you to understand that even though they think the statue is ugly, like some of these statues I think is ugly, I understand that it's priceless. It's worth, it's invaluable. You as a believer, you as the broken blessed, need to come to that point where you realize it doesn't matter how you view me, it doesn't matter what you think of me, it doesn't matter how you feel about me, but the banner that's over my head is the banner of God, and because of that, I am invaluable, I am priceless, and I'm worth so much, you can't even begin to imagine what God can do in my life. We need to get to that point as the broken blessed. When Jesus took the fish and the, and the loaves, and getting close to the end, when he took the fish and the loaves, right? After he blessed it, he prayed on it, after he blessed it, what did he do? Broke it, then it multiplied. Breaking it caused him to bless the people. You see, the reason that we have to be broken is because it's through our brokenness that we'll be blessed. Hey. Jesus broke the fish and loaves and blessed a multitude. Yes. He wants to bless a multitude through you, but are you willing to let him break you to be blessed? You see, it's because of your value that you need to be broken so that now you can go out and share with others. That's what God wants to do through you. That's what he's done before. Jesus Christ, after the resurrection, when he came back, easily could have came through a new body. You know, historians say, especially back then, they People were short and like really like scrawny. So they said like, you know, Jesus was really like not attractive, probably really short, scrawny, darker dude, you know, wool hair, he's black. Um, so <laughs> people, people always say, you know, you know, he, that, that's the time. Crucified comes back. But when he comes back, he doesn't come in this new, glorious, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger body. Uh, maybe I don't know, John Van Vendor, I don't know, who y'all like, who looks good? Idris Elba, he doesn't come through looking like Idris Elba. He comes through with that broken body, the same body where pierced through the side, the same body where there were scars in his hands. You know why? Because the scar represents that, yes, I was hurt, yes, 
I was broken, but there's healing. The scar shows that though there was brokenness, there is no hole. Though there was hurt, there is nothing that there is no breach. That's what the scar represents. So we need to come to that point where we're willing to flex and show our scars because yes, I've been hurt. Yes, I bled. Yes, I've gone through, but there is no breach for you. There's no breach for the enemy, and there's no breach for anybody who's going to be a hater. God, I am your broken blessing, and I'm going to move forward, accept that, and walk into it. And we as believers need to get to that point. So don't disqualify me because of my hurt. Don't disqualify me because of my pain. Don't disqualify me because of my tears. I need you to understand that is your badge of honor. Yeah. That is my badge of honor. And that's why I can be the broken blessed. And that's why you can be the broken blessed. Because it's through that that God will touch the multitude through us. Are we ready as a people? If we're saying, God, throughout this month, we want to look at this renew me topic. We want to talk about your fresh word. We want to talk about your vision. We want to talk about all these things. But am I willing to go through the brokenness? And when I go through that brokenness, when I go through the wilderness, will I have the understanding that it's this brokenness that highlights how blessed that I really am? We need to begin to have that mindset. Amen. And if you want that mindset, or if you have it already, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to pray together. This prayer acknowledging the brokenness.